Alleluia, Alleluia, Alleluia. One does not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of God. The Lord be with you. A reading from the Holy Gospel according to Mark. In those days when, again, a great crowd was following Jesus, he realized they had nothing to eat. So he summoned the disciples and said, My heart is moved with pity for the crowd because they have been with me now for three days and have nothing to eat. If I send them away hungry to their homes, they will collapse on the way, and some of them may have come a long distance. His disciples answered him, Where can anyone get enough bread to satisfy them here in this deserted place? Still, he asked them, How many loaves do you have? They replied, Seven. He ordered the crowd to sit on the ground. Then, taking the seven loaves, he gave thanks, broke them, and gave them to his disciples to distribute. And they distributed them to the crowd. They also had a few fish. He said the blessing over them and ordered them distributed also. They ate and were satisfied. They picked up the fragments left over, seven baskets. There were about 4,000 people. He dismissed the crowd and got into the boat with his disciples and came to the region of Del Munta. The Gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. I think since the last time I was here, I mentioned that I was going to the Holy Land. Well, I went and I came back, obviously. Um, and whenever I, I told the people uh, in my own parishes back in, in New York and Jersey, uh, whenever I read the scriptures after that trip to the Holy Land, they're never the same. I, I visualize all the places that are mentioned in the scriptures that we visited. And of course, today is one of them. After Jesus does his miracle, he gets into the boat and goes to another town. Um, the boat, usually on the Sea of Galilee, sometimes called the, the Sea of Tiberias, is, was a typical fisherman's boat. And in the museum near the Sea of Galilee, they had this huge boat that was of the time of Jesus, and it was a fisherman's boat of the time of Jesus. No guarantee that that was Jesus. They had, they had surfaced it, and they preserved it so it could be appreciated. And then after that, we got on a boat very similar to that, that had a, a, a covering, like a little awning. Uh, we were about 30 people, and we sailed onto the Sea of Galilee. Peace like you can't imagine. And and they had music playing on the boat. It was a pilgrimage, so everyone was very conscious of the, the prayerfulness of it and the spirituality of it. And as we sailed out, the boat captain shut the music and just let us listen to the waves. So that's what comes to mind today when I see Jesus dismissed the crowds, got into a boat with his disciples to another area. The peace that he initiated every time now we hear about the Sea of Galilee is, is part of our lives. Today we have a very interesting combination of readings. We have the readings from the Book of Kings, and anything from the Book of Kings, ironically, is not about their accomplishments. All the book of, books of Kings are dedicated to the errors of the kings. And today we have Jeroboam, one of the, the most famous, you know, bad kings. And what he's doing, he's jealous that people are going to the temple and not coming to his temple. You see, the sin of 
Israelites was not paganism only, but worshiping of idols. Just think back to Moses and, and the, the, the commandments. When, when the, Moses was up in the mountain, dialoguing with God, the people below created an idol out of, out of gold. Now that's significant because that's the thing that pulls them away from God. We have our own idols that pull us away from God, regrettably still, but this was the, 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 um, the manifestation of their paganism. But they weren't pagans, they were Israelites who fi often failed in their faith. Throughout the research of the Holy Land and all the extensive lands around there, many idols have been found, little statues. Little, well, like, like we have statues, but we don't worship our statues. We, we honor the subject that they depict, Mary, Jesus, St. Joseph, St. Anthony, etc. But the pagan element in Judaism worshipped those little idols, and they had shrines in their houses. They weren't supposed to. But they did, because they were from a pagan culture, and they were very influenced by the pagan culture. So that was, that's why the first commandment is the first commandment. I am the Lord your God. No idols before me. And that was the constant turmoil that went on through the Israelite kings. They always had an inclination that they were more important than the covenant with God. And Jeroboam was one of them today, and he builds his own little temple and puts his own gold animals in, in the temple, and he's hoping the people will come to his temple, the false temple, but they keep going to the temple, Sinai, um, uh, Zion, they call it. It's, it's a mounded area. Now, those temples are all gone. They were gone by the pagans, then, then the Romans, and, and they haven't been rebuilt. But only thing left of the temple is one wall, and you know it's called the Wailing Wall or the Western Wall. And Jesus was there. Jesus was at that temple. It's very interesting. It was destroyed in 70 AD. Jesus was there already, living in the area, visiting the temple often. Okay, with all that coming together, and we have Jesus compassionate, I, I want to say we're worshiping the right person, Jesus Christ, who was presented to us by the Holy Spirit, but in the flesh presented to us by Mary. Now, early on after Vatican II, people got a little hysterical because we had such a great devotion to Mary, and some people said, oh, you Catholics worship Mary. We don't worship Mary. We, we pray to Mary, who is the intercessor, and she presents our prayers to her son, who in turn presents them to the Father. That's how we pray. So you can ask Mary anything, and she's not going to answer you. She'll ask her son to answer you. That's, that's the purpose of our prayer to, to Mary. And today we honor Mary because it's a Saturday, and, and I think uh, it's a nice tradition we have in the church to pause one day a week when there's no special saint and say Saturdays are devoted to Mary. Another very important thing is Mary gives birth to Jesus. She replaces the Ark of the Covenant, the great box that was in the temple that held the tablets. And that Ark box of the Covenant, the, 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 the tablets, was the Holy of Holies. They called it the Shekinah. It was hidden behind a great veil, and, and the priests would go there and offer incense to God. They didn't see God but they imagined that the wings on top of this box of the angel was the presence of God, the Shekinah. Now, the temple is destroyed in 70. We don't know where the, the ark went to. Uh, we have pictures of it being carried, sculpture of it being carried away in Rome because it was the, the Titus, the, the general, who carried all of the great objects from the temple back to Rome as, as booty. So we have the Arch of Titus in Rome, and on it we see the Romans carrying away the Ark, carrying away the, the candelabra, and all the other ornaments from the temple. However, 
we still have the temple, the presence of Mary. Mary gives birth to the word of God. Mary comes forward to us and is pregnant with the word of God, with Jesus Christ. She becomes the new presence holding God, Jesus. So she is the new Ark of the, Co Ark of the Covenant. Her whole body contains God, Jesus Christ. She is called, and, and, and we have a Greek town close to here, uh, Tarpon, and there it's very clear in their art and architecture and church that Mary is always Theotekos, Theotekos, uh, as they say, Theotekos, the one who carries God. And you never see Mary alone. Like We have a tradition of her as Lourdes or uh, Immaculate Conception when she's alone. Th that's fine. The Greeks never picture Mary without Jesus. And she's always he he's always here, right in front of her, because she presents us with Jesus, her son. So Mary is the temple. She's the Ark of the Covenant. And she gives us his, her son, Jesus. You might say the Shekinah, the presence of God. We come to church, we look at the tabernacle, design like the ark was holding nothing like the ark it's holding the bread of the eucharist the presence of jesus in the flesh in the eucharistic flesh so as we honor mary as mother of of jesus we, we have to realize our history as judeo-christians goes back to the original temple the original kings that want to replace the temple with paganism. Jesus was confronted with that same experience. They wanted to replace Jesus. Go back to the old law. We don't like what you're doing. What do you mean introducing us to a new way of understanding God? The nerve you have trying to tell us that we are supposed to take care of the poor and feed the hungry, and, and in that we're worshiping God. Well, will crucify you for that. And he did. He was crucified. But who was at the cross? Besides John and Magdalene, Mary. She saw him to the end. The Ark of the Covenant, Mary, is looking at the covenant, the fulfillment of the covenant, Jesus Christ. So our history, as, as people, can appreciate our lineage, going back to Jesus, and his ancestors on earth. But our faith as Christians goes back beyond that to the presence of God in heaven. And Jesus is sent to us through his mother, through a woman like the women here in church. Yes, she was clean. Yes, she was pure. Yes, she was special. Yes, she was chosen because of her personality, because of devotion to God, because of her I don't want to say simplicity because she was far from a simple woman. T to receive a message from an angel must have really, you know, sent her for a loop. But she had faith in the message of God. That's our role model. She had faith in the message of God. She had faith in what she was going to do was something special and spectacular. Bring the Savior to you and me. So she wasn't simple by, by a long shot. She was a strong woman who was devoted to God, who gave us the Son of God in the flesh, who stood by him, even when he was off and preaching and people thought he was nuts. She was there with him. She went to, with the apostles to one of the homes he was preaching in. And when they say, um, your mother's outside, why don't, why don't you get out? Your mother's outside with your brothers and sisters, people from his hometown. And what'd he do? Who's my mother? Who are my brothers and sisters? Those who follow the will of God. So Jesus, in that little sentence, reminds us that we are his brothers and sisters. And Mary is our mother. And of course, it's summarized on the cross when he speaks to John and looks down at John and Mary and says, John, this is your mother. Mary, my words, these are your children. 